Today, we will be dealing with one of the most thrilling applications of calculus, which is rocket science. Imagine you're sitting in a rocket, counting down to lift off. The engines roar, flames burst out, and suddenly you're accelerating towards space. This sounds so cool, right? Rockets are amazing machines, but do you know that their motion is super tricky? Now, what if I tell you that with just basic physics and simple calculus, we could predict exactly how fast a rocket will move into space? Wouldn't that be fascinating? Let's dive into understanding how a rocket works in a very simple manner, perfect for someone who's never thought about rockets before. Picture a rocket as a big tank filled with fuel. The fuel inside doesn't just sit there, it's burned up to make hot gases, which will then be ejected from the backside of the rocket to push the rocket in the upward direction. This is simply because of Newton's third law of motion, which states that every action has an equal and opposite reaction. So, this means that when the rocket pushes fuel downward or ejects it, the fuel pushes the rocket back with an equal force, propelling the rocket upward. Now, the speed at which the fuel is ejected out is called R which we will assume to be constant for our case. It simply tells us how much fuel the rocket uses every second. If R is 10 kilograms per second, that just means the rocket burns and throws out 10 kilograms of fuel every second. So, because the rocket is losing fuel, its mass keeps on decreasing as time passes by. At the start, the rocket has a total mass called M0. Think of this as everything. The rocket's body, its engines, whatever it's carrying, like astronauts or satellites, plus all the fuel. The structure part, or MS, is all the stuff that doesn't burn, like the metal body, the engines, and whatever the rocket's carrying. Maybe a satellite or people. This MS stays the same the whole time. The fuel part is what gets used up. It's the stuff that burns to make the rocket go. So, if M0 is 100 kilograms and MS is 30 kilograms, then the fuel starts at 70 kilograms. As the rocket flies, assume it burns fuel at R equals 10 kilograms per second. After one second, it has burned 10 kilograms, so the fuel left is 60 kilograms, and the total mass is now 90 kilograms, which is MS or 30 plus 60. After two seconds, it's down to 50 kilograms of fuel, and the total mass is 80 kilograms. This keeps going until the fuel hits zero, and the mass is just MS, or 30 kilograms, in our example. Now let us talk about another important variable, U, which is called the exhaust velocity. When the rocket burns its fuel, it turns it into hot gases and blasts them out of a nozzle at the bottom. This speed U is how fast those gases are moving when they leave the rocket, and it's always the same speed as long as the rocket's engine is designed that way, which means this U is also a constant value. Here's the key thing. U is measured relative to the rocket itself. What does that mean? Imagine you're sitting on the rocket as it flies up, from where you're sitting, you look down and see the gases shooting out the back at U speed, say 1,000 meters per second downwards, compared to you and the rocket. But how fast are those gases moving compared to someone standing on Earth watching the launch? That's a bit trickier because the rocket itself is moving upward. Say the rocket is moving upward at a speed of V meters per second, which is, say, 200 meters per second, for example with respect to the observer standing on Earth. So, the speed of the ejected fuel relative to the ground should be V minus U in the upward direction, right? So it will be 200 minus 1,000 or minus 800 meters per second. Negative sign here means it is simply moving in a downward direction of 800 meters per second with respect to the observer standing on Earth. But why is it V? minus U, you may ask. Suppose this rocket is moving along the Y-axis at 200 meters per second, and we draw this line 
where y equals zero, and assume the rocket is at y equals zero with respect to the observer standing on Earth. And at this moment, the fuel will be ejected by the rocket down at 1,000 meters per second relative to the rocket. So after one second, the rocket will be at this point where y equals 200 meters, right? And the fuel's position will be 1,000 meters below this point, right? Because the fuel speed of 1,000 meters per second is with respect to the rocket. So with respect to the rocket, it will be 1,000 meters below it. Therefore, its distance with respect to this point will be 800 meters, isn't it? This means that with respect to the observer standing on Earth, the speed of fuel is 800 meters per second downward. Noise. Imagine pushing a shopping cart. If it's full of heavy stuff, it's hard to get going. As you take stuff out, it gets lighter, and the same push makes it move faster. That's what's happening with the rocket. Its acceleration keeps growing as it loses mass. This goes on until the fuel runs out, also known as the burnout time. Once the fuel's gone, there's no more thrust, no more gases shooting out. Now, only gravity is acting, pulling the rocket down. It'll keep rising for a bit because of the speed it built up, but gravity slows it down. Eventually, it'll stop going up and start falling back to Earth, unless it's going so fast it escapes the clutch of the gravity or enters the space. But that's the story we can cover next time. Finally, we need to understand one more concept of physics, which is none other than Newton's second law of motion, and we can then start to build our mathematical model. Imagine you're pushing a shopping cart. When you push the cart, which means when you apply the external force, the cart's motion changes. It speeds up or slows down depending on how hard you shove it. This change in motion, combined with how heavy the cart is, is called a change in momentum. Newton's second law simply says that the force you apply is equal to how quickly the momentum changes. Momentum is just mass times velocity. So, if either mass or velocity changes, momentum changes too. Mathematically, the external force acting on the object, or Fe, is equal to change in momentum, or delta P, divided by change in time, or delta T. Now, here comes the real magic. Imagine our rocket moving upward. At some initial time, Ti, suppose it has a certain mass, m, and it's moving at a speed, v. So the rocket's momentum right now, or its initial momentum, P, I, is M times V, right? Now after a very small time interval, DT, the rocket ejects some fuel from the back of it. The amount of fuel burned in this small time, DT, is a small chunk of mass we'll call DM. Since DM is the mass that leaves the rocket, the rocket loses that much weight. So if it started with mass M, then after dt time, its new mass is m minus dm, right? Now, if we write the mass of the rocket after time dt as m plus d capital M, then comparing both of them gives dm equals minus dm. So in other words, it's just a way to say the rocket's mass drops by that little bit d small m that got burned. Now, what about speed? The rocket started at speed v, but because it's pushing out gas and fighting gravity, its speed changes a tiny bit by the end of dt. We'll call that tiny speed change as dv. So the new speed of the rocket is v plus dv. So we can see that two things have shifted. Rocket, whose mass is now m, minus dm, and the speed is v plus dv. Also, there's that little bit of gas, dm that got shot out from the back with the speed v minus u with respect to the ground as shown earlier, and both of them have their own momentum. Let's add up all the momentum at final time tf, which is ti plus dt. Rocket's new momentum will be m minus dm times v plus dv. Then there's the gas's momentum, dm times v minus u. So, the total final momentum pf will be this plus this. Expand this to get this, and expand this to get this. 
Oh, look, both of them cancel out. Also, this part is super, super tiny because they are simply two small changes multiplied together, so we usually ignore it. Hence, we are left with this. Now, what's the change in momentum dp? It will simply be pf, or this final momentum minus pi, or this initial momentum. This gets canceled out, and we are left with this. That's how much the momentum changes in this small time interval dt. Now we have Newton's second law, where Fe, or the external force applied on the object, is equal to change in momentum, or dp, divided by change in time, or dt, or this. Now what's the external force acting on this rocket? Yeah, right. It's gravity. So Fe will simply be minus m times g. Since gravity pulling down and upward direction is positive, hence the minus sign here. Now dp over dt will be this, and when we separate the terms, we get this. Let us equate Fe to dp over dt to get this. And you know what? This u times dm over dt is actually the thrust force applied on the rocket. Next, do you remember d capital M equals minus of d small m? Let us put it here to get this. Now take this on the right-hand side to get this. Finally, multiply both sides by dt over m to get this. This is the equation of motion governing how the rocket's velocity changes as it burns fuel under the effect of gravity. Amazing! Now we will use integration to solve for v. Here we will integrate dv from initial velocity, v0, to a velocity at time t, or v of t. Then here we will integrate m from initial mass, m0, to a mass at time t, or m of t. And here we obviously integrate time from 0 to t. Since this video is about the application of calculus in real life, I will not be showing how to integrate. But if you are interested to know more about it, I have already made two videos on the same, and the link is in the description below. This will simply give v of t minus v zero. This will become u times natural log of m zero over m of t, and this will be minus g times t. Take v zero here, and we have the equation for the velocity of the rocket. This is super cool. We can also write m of t as m zero minus r times t where r is the rate at which the fuel is burnt. Now here's the super fun part. As soon as the fuel completely burns out, there is no longer thrust force acting on the rocket, and now the gravity will pull it down. So for time greater than burnout time, this part will be zero. And we get v equals this. Let us plot a graph for v of t versus time. These are the parameters we will use. Oh, look, it is the same as we predicted. This is the burnout time. Before this time, the velocity increases, and then after this time, it decreases because of gravity. Let us look at one more cool thing. We can find the altitude of this rocket y of t with respect to the surface of the Earth, where y is zero when t is zero by simply integrating the velocity because we know that distance equals speed multiplied by time. This gives y of t as this, and when we plot it using the same parameters, we get the same behavior as expected. It increases during burn, and it peaks post-burnout, then decreases. That was simply out of this world. Isn't this a miracle how calculus and the physics developed by Sir Isaac Newton shows how small changes create big impacts? shaping everything from falling apples to flying rockets. If this video gets 10,000 likes, then I will bring more amazing applications like this. So good.